So I want to talk about three specific types of night imagery. First one, cityscapes, um, architectural stuff with non-natural light uh, at night. Um, the second one is shooting the moon. And then the third one is uh, star trails. And that's going to be kind of a segue between us. What's that? Well, cityscapes, the moon, star trails. Okay. Bam. All right. Um, so uh, this actually I shot with my iPhone. It looks terrible on that pixelated screen. Um, all right. Um, in my opinion, these are necessities for cityscapes. Um, when I shoot in the city at night, I've got my tripod, and I'm looking for a longer exposure. Uh, so I always shoot with a lower ISO. This actually I shot with, uh, it was on my D50, and I think I shot it with ISO 800, which um, was about the upper practical limit of a D50. And I'm really frustrated by how pixely it is, but uh, it is very grainy, and it's a storm photo, and I love it because the grain kind of adds to that attitude of it. Um, that was... Uh, when was it? February. Uh, I was standing on ice. Lake Michigan was a disaster, and it was a phenomenal night. Um, and my jeans actually kind of froze that evening. Um, but I typically will lower my ISO to 100 to 200 um, to maximize the quality of the image that I'm taking, uh, everything else notwithstanding. Um, I also shoot a relatively small aperture. I'm trying to extend my image as long as possible. So I'm going to shoot at at least f8, and typically I'm f13, 16, uh, depending on uh, how bright uh, the city is. I'll shoot f22, uh, just because I want to um, extend that out. Uh, I also want to get as much as possible in um, sharp focus. The front of this on Buckingham Fountain, that little thing sticking out of the water, and the Sears Tower spires are both almost perfectly in focus. Um, I believe this was shot at F22. Uh, and you'll see that was in 2008. That's about a year after I started shooting night. Um, and one of the best things that I did after I started shooting at night was I started taking a friend with me, and we learned together. We'd take trips down to Chicago. We'd leave at like 7 o'clock from Schaumburg. And we'd stay out there until 2 in the morning. Um, and I met lots of police officers because they wanted to know why I was out so late. Uh, especially being that I look so dumb. Um, the other thing is a tripod. I put this image up there intentionally because it's not a tripod shot. Um, this was two nights after I moved down to Chicago. I went to a Sox game. I didn't have a tripod with me, obviously. I got bored with the baseball game. I'm not a sports guy. So I walked out on the exit ramp. And they've got this nice ledge, set my camera there, stuck my wallet underneath the lens, and took that photo of the cityscape. Um, there we go, a little bit more detail. Uh, and the projector adjusts, of course. Uh, all that to say you need something to hold your camera steady. Uh, the guy that I would go down with frequently didn't carry a tripod. He carried a beanbag that was about this big. Um, he didn't want the bulk of a tripod, so he would stick the beanbag on anything. Uh, he even asked the taxi cab driver to stop one time, stuck the beanbag on top of his car, put his camera up there, took a photo, thanked the guy, gave him a $5 bill, and, you know, left. Um, it was a rather interesting scene. Um, and then the last thing that I take is a remote or a timer. Um, a remote, if you can, there are some situations where forget my remote, I don't want to take it, um, and I will just set my camera to the three second timer, I'll press the shutter button, and then I'll take my hand away so that I don't get any movement in the camera body. Um, remotes are cheap. If you don't have one, get one off of Amazon. The knockoffs for Nikons and Canons are like 20 bucks. Uh, you can get the IR remote, you have to point it directly at the camera, you can get the plug-in one. Um, they even have remotes that are programmable that are like 30 bucks. So. Uh, yeah, really, if you have a $600 camera body, you don't have an excuse not to have a $30 remote. Um, this one's a, I believe it's a 45 second exposure. It's from the top of a parking garage. Um, and right now I'm drawing a complete blank on the streets. But that's an L, 
uh, train going through there. Um, we're on that S curve, and I love that photo. Uh, it's the background on my laptop. Um, and then the last one, and this isn't this isn't my necessity. This is me telling you that you want to use this no matter what. Your camera has a histogram. It's that funny thing that shows you where the light is. Um, use the histogram because at night your LCD is pushing light at you. You don't get an accurate reading from your eyes. Your eyes play tricks on you. You can see better at night than your camera can. There's all sorts of reasons to depend on your histogram instead of your own vision to determine whether or not your image is properly exposed. Um, most SLRs also have, uh, there's many names for it, um, overexposed areas and underexposed areas, zebra striping, whatever you want to call it, um, where it will indicate what part of the image is overexposed. Uh, in this image, I can guarantee that my camera would indicate that all of this is overexposed. That's fine, I don't care. Um, but it would tell me that this area has a lot of blue and a lot of texture, and that's what I wanted in that image. You saw it on the laptop screen. It looks uh, not quite that dark. In fact, see? Okay. Anyway, yes? So, how are you, <clears throat> sorry, how are you determining exposure? Just trial and error or what? Um, I'm about to get to that, but I will answer that question. Um, when I first started, I would use the camera to cheat for me. I would set manually set the ISO in my camera to whatever I thought I needed it to be. 100, 200, 400, whatever it was. And then I would let the camera take a picture. And I'd look at the camera and go, oh, okay, it took an 80th of a second or an eighth of a second. And then I would manually adjust my settings accordingly. Um, now, it's trial and error, a lot of it. No, I don't use a light meter. I don't use any mechanical tool that assist me. Um, in downtown scenes, uh, if I'm trying to get a particular effect, um, I have a general idea of what I'm shooting for there. Uh, Buckingham Fountain, there's a lot of ambient light just floating around. There's a lot of assistance right there. Um, so, you know, I'm shooting at a tenth to a thirtieth of a second um, and probably F11. But for a longer exposure where I can smooth out the water a little bit, get a nicer reflection, then I'm going to drop my, I'm going to push my f-stop up higher, drop my shutter speed down even further, get longer, you know, and that's probably um, maybe 30 seconds, I would imagine, uh, you know. So a, a lot of trial and error, um, a lot of go down there, shoot 60 images, end up with three that I would actually show to the public, but I would encourage you to always do that with all of your images. I uh, don't show everybody everything that you shoot. They don't want to see it anyway. Um, all right. Uh, and like I said, if it's your first time shooting outside, use the auto on your camera. The camera's smart. Um, it will tell you what general settings you're going for, and then, you know, adjust from there. Uh, if you put up your tripod on the corner of Chicago and Spring Street on Saturday, and you shoot those lovely brick buildings that are all nice and contrasty over in the corner and it shoots it at a fifth of a second and you want to get a little bit more movement in the clouds, then adjust your camera settings accordingly. But use your camera as a tool to benefit you. I keep on standing in the way of that color. I'm sorry, Mark. Um, things to watch out for. Uh, street lights, windows especially. Windows will do weird things with light. Uh, Reflections that you don't notice beforehand, um, things behind the window that you didn't notice and all of a sudden they become apparent, uh, and then reflections in general, um, and then ghosts. Um, a lot of what I shoot, I shoot long enough so that if someone's walking in front of me, you won't notice it. But occasionally you'll get the lady in the red dress who walks right in front of your camera and then stops for a half a second and keeps on walking. And so you end up with this great exposed image and a red smudge. And you're like, thank you, you looked great, but not in front of my tripod. Um, or at least stand there for a longer period of time. Uh, this image I did intentionally, and then it turned out terrible. And so I just uh, used all of the things that are wrong with the image to my advantage uh, and made it black and white, bumped up the contrast through the roof. And I think it's kind of a cool image. I really like it. I have a question on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know exactly where that where that is. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything that's 
goes by up, up at the top that would make those streaks? I am sitting about this low, and that is a bus. Oh. That is a bus, and right there is the bus window. So that's perspective. That's yeah. Um, and the reason why I put that image up there is the the blur on the most of the top of the blur is the lights inside of the bus window. Right. So. Um, I think it's cool. What's that? I think it's cool. Right. I think I think post it's a great image. If you saw the straight out of camera, it looks like an amateur shot. I mean, if you've done, so, if you've been at a different perspective, it wouldn't have that. If yeah. It's standing, just, you know. Off. Regular yeah, I, uh, that's a general observation about um, almost anything that I shoot. My tripod is almost never here. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's where we see all of the world. If you want an interesting perspective, go down or up or to the side. Do something different because all of us see at about 5'5 five, five to 6 foot. Right, right. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, that's cityscapes. Any questions? I'm burning through this. I apologize. Anything? Okay. Um, segue. This is my fourth topic. Um, <laughs> high ISO photos. One of my favorite things to do within the past year is to take my camera out. I don't take my tripod. It's two in the morning, and I will push the ISO through the roof, and I will just hand hold. Um, the reason why I bring this up is there's a lot that can be learned from pushing your ISO as high as you can. Uh, first of all, you learn what the upper limit of your camera is uh, capability, but then um, also you can tell how much color is still in an image even with all of that grain and all of that noise. And if you choose an image that's got a lot of contrasty colors like that red and yellow, um, you're still going to end up with a very dynamic image. Um, uh, you can learn your camera's limits. Um, there's a difference between what your camera says it will shoot at and what it's practically usable at. Like my D7000 says it will shoot, I believe, at 12,000 ISO. Um, it kind of looks like sandpaper. So uh, the maximum that I would shoot with that is 3,200-ish. And each camera is unique, each camera sensor technically. Um, and then also you get to know your shutter speed limits. I can handhold about... Uh, a fraction of a second that my um, width of my camera lens is. So if I'm in an uh, 18 millimeter lens, then I'm about a 20th of a second I can handhold that. Uh, in certain circumstances, I can handhold for, for, for longer periods, but that's about it. If I'm shooting a longer lens, like a 200 millimeter, 200th of a second. It's a general rule of thumb. So what stabilization you have? I don't know. I don't have any image stabilized lens, lenses. Um, I would assume it would get better, but frequently at night, image stabilization can work against you. Um, and by the way, you can increase your ability to handhold by doing all sorts of things. Um, if I'm shooting an event, tripods aren't allowed. I've got my 200 millimeter lens. My back is always against the wall. I'm pressing against it. It's an extra security there. Um, and so a lot of your handhold rules apply for indoor photography because it would be terrible to shoot in this room. It's really dark in here, but our eyes are adjusting. Um, the other thing that I'll do is I'll push the ISO up just to give an artistic feel like uh, what I unintentionally did with that storm photo. Uh, you can add a lot of character to an image, a lot of grain. Uh, I've seen a lot of guys who will shoot with um, a higher ISO if they're doing street photography. It adds just a depth to the image. Um, and then shoot the challenge. Uh, and then you've learned this. Uh, modern cameras have higher and higher um, practical limits to their ISO. Uh, if I bought the replacement for the D7000 that Nikon currently sells, it goes up to 52,000 ISO, and it's practically usable at 12,000. So you keep on getting more information out of that sensor, more usable information. Uh, this was handheld. This is um, one of my favorite handheld photos. And uh, that's, I think it's a second and a half. Um, I just held down the shutter and pointed the camera. It's with like a 100 millimeter lens. And those are gnats flying in front of the light. 
So there are some instances where handheld, uh, handheld is fine and you don't need the assistance of the camera because it's a cool image. All right, um, last thing is, shoot, uh, second to last thing is shooting the moon. Um, goodness, it's killing me. There, much better. All right, um, that light up there is the moon. The moon is ridiculously bright in comparison to the rest of the night sky. Um, it will ruin most of your stellar photography if you get the moon even on the horizon. You get so much light in the atmosphere, so much refraction throughout the um, moisture in the atmosphere. So you have to work with the moon and its ambient brightness. Um, I just covered that. Uh, you can shoot the moon handheld with a shoot 300 millimeter lens <coughs> because the moon is that bright. Um, there's several caveats that you know it's just a sliver. It's not going to work. The moon's not bright enough. But I'd say anything over a half moon, you're good. Uh, in fact, this the shutter speed on it is an 800th of a second, um, and I shot it at ISO 400, so I pushed that up a little bit. Um, but that's with a 300 millimeter lens, completely handheld, standing in my front yard. Uh, I believe it was a February night. So the moon is very bright. Um, use the longest lens that you own. This is actually where your less expensive crop cameras have an advantage. Because when you use a crop camera, a 300 millimeter lens looks like it reaches farther than a 300 millimeter lens on a um, full frame camera. And the other thing is, typically crop frame lenses are less expensive, and so we can afford them a little bit better. Uh, like I have a 300 millimeter lens for my Nikon that's about $150. Mm. Uh, it's cheap. Uh, there's a distinct difference between my 80 to 200 and my 70 to 300, my expensive one and my cheap one. Um, but for a lot of stuff, the 300 is a lot of fun to work with. Um, a full moon is a lot harder to shoot for one very simple reason. If the sunlight is hitting it directly on, you don't get shadows. And so you end up with a gray layered surface, but you don't have texture to it. You don't have peaks and valleys. And so I would encourage you, if you're going to go out and shoot the moon, shoot it when it's at some portion of a crescent, somewhere along the line. Um, oh. <laughs> and <laughs> we're on to the next topic already. Um, the other thing is the moon rises and sets in a predictable pattern. So for a while, I wanted to get a shot of the moon waning and waxing the entire you know thing. And uh, I learned very quickly that sometimes the moon rises. In fact. Um, when the moon is a particular shape, it always rises at roughly the same time because it's the moon is showing you a relationship of you to the moon to the sun. And the sun's always in the same spot. So you and the moon are the only things that are moving. Um, so if you want to shoot anything besides that or less, you're going to have to wake up really early in the morning. And I'm a night owl, so I never finish the project. Um, anyway, any questions about shooting the moon? Can you just it later? Um, I will, uh, with the moon, I won't use any form of autofocus. I've never, I've had five Nikons now, and I have yet to have any of them adequately be able to focus on the moon. So that is a detraction. Um, I don't know if that's a Nikon thing. I don't know if that's an inexpensive, you know, uh, crop frame thing. I, I don't know what that is, but uh, if you aren't able to look through the viewfinder and able to focus manually, uh, it's going to be difficult. I have thousands of images uh, that are out of focus because I couldn't um, automatically focus. Manually set it up and give yourself at least an F4, 5, 6, or F8 f-stop that's going to be in focus. The, the problem, and this is a cheap lens thing, but the problem with cheap lenses is infinity is not always infinity. It's not just the age of love. Yeah. Love. Just and, 
and and here comes and here is the.
Okay. Make it's a number 14, Josh. I'm not building lens number 14. I didn't know the welding had glass. <laughs> Various companies actually make solar filters for telescopes that you buy the size for your camera. So what the colors are a little bit off, uh, some are bluish, orange, but yeah. you can see the sun spike and photograph sunspots there. One of the most fascinating series of photos, since we're going to segue into that real quick, is a series of photos of the International Space Station um, and in front of the sun that a guy in France was the first one that I saw, yeah, and took his telescope and put something in front of it, some type of amazing welding glass, and um, was able to capture the International Space Station traveling in front of the sun as one of the space shuttles, shuttles disconnected from it. Fascinating images. A couple of, about a year later, I saw a similar series of images of the space station in front of the moon. Um, just amazing uh, level of technical achievement and artistic creativity. Um, something that I'm, I'm not going to come close to. Let's, let's just be honest. <laughs> i got to get a telescope next year. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be next year. All right. Lastly, star trails. Um, this is by far my favorite um, of the star trail images that I've shot. I've gone out about a dozen times with the intention of shooting moving stars. I can illustrate quite a few things about star trails with this image. Um, I just blanked out on the constellation, um, the W. Thank you. Um, you'll all recognize that that's the North Star because everything rotates around it, right? And really the stars aren't moving, we are, that makes sense. Um, that's Cassiopeia. Uh, there's one other constellation on here that we should be able to recognize, but I don't see it right now and I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, this is actually, I'm standing behind a gymnasium and there is a street light about a quarter mile that way that's illuminating those trees. Beyond that, about a mile is a very small town. Maybe two gas stations and a couple of Baptist churches because it's down in Mississippi and everything's a Baptist church. Um, 30 minute exposure. And uh, I, I love the contrast between the blue and the yellow. Uh, there it is. Oh. Yeah, see? Yeah. That's what the projector ought to show us. Um, I took it uh, right after midnight on New Year's Day. Um, so the year had just turned, it became 2011, and I shot this amazing photo. And I tried multiple times to get a better image, and I have never succeeded. That's my favorite. There are better ones out there, by far. But this is mine. How long is the 30 minutes. 30 minutes, and what are you Uh Probably 200. I can almost guarantee it was 200, based on the camera I was using. Um, 30. It's a 30 minute, 30 minute exposure. Oh, 30 minute yep. exposure. Now, there are two ways to shoot star trails. James is going to talk about the second one. Um, and I will give you the 20 second overview to illustrate the difference. Um, James's technique that he's going to show you is to take a series of very short images. My technique is to take one long image or a series of long images. There is caution to be said. Um, exposing your camera for that long can damage the sensor if too much light comes in. At night, when you're shooting the stars, it's probably not going to happen. But if this were a road and I were doing it and somebody came over and shined their brights into my camera for three minutes, I have that potential. You can read about it on Nikon, Canon's website. They will warn you. Okay? That's why. Um, it's, it's not a default setting, or it is, but you know, it, your camera only goes to a 30 second exposure, and from there you have to manually control it, all right? So, caution, all right? Don't take your camera down to the city, uh, down to Chicago, and do a 30 minute exposure of the city. It's not going to turn out, and it will likely damage your sensor. All right, I'm done with all my asterisks. Now we get to talk about it. Um, this is one of my favorite, this is my second favorite image of Star Trails. Um, I had a Nikon D80, and all of the D60s and D80s had problems with electronic noise here and there on the sensor. Um, this was a friend's barn, 
and uh, that's also a 30 minute exposure. It might be like maybe a 25 minute exposure. Um, there's a street back here, that's what that is. Um, and I stood out there, it was April, it was cold, and I love the image. Um, in color, because of the damage to the image, this is purple and that's green. So that's why it's black and white. Um, the North Star is where it's at. Everything rotates around the North Star visually. Um, were you the one that said everything moves in the sky? The North Star does too. Uh, the North Star isn't exactly in the center, so if you leave your shutter open long enough, you'll notice a little bit of movement in the North Star. Um, the North Star star is higher in the winter, so there's an advantage. You'll get more movement underneath the North Star in the winter. That's because we're faced uh, less toward the sun with the rotation and everything. I'm not going to get um, planetary and orbital mechanics, but the, the North Star appears to be higher in the sky. The North Star is also higher in the sky the further north you are. So if you go up in Wisconsin, it's going to appear higher than if you're in Mississippi or Illinois. Um, the, north, the stars nearest the North Star appear to move the least. Want more motion? Want longer streaks? Move your uh, framing away from the North Star. Um, and then all stars will move over time. If you're trying to stop the motion of the stars, and you're facing south, it's incredibly difficult because you're shooting the night sky, so you don't have much light, and those stars move apparently very rapidly because you're faced away from the axis of you know the motion. So about a 20th of a second is all you get if you face due south. Um, and by the way, this depends on what lens you're shooting with. You shoot with a really wide lens, and there's less motion because you're covering more of the sky. You shoot with a long lens, like a 200 millimeter, and you know you're going to get motion quicker in your image. There's, it's a learning experience. If you shoot facing north, like the Big Dipper, um, it's actually kind of easy. Uh, you know, you set your ISO at like 400, and you use the fastest lens you have on the fastest setting. Give yourself a little, you know, something in the foreground to give a little perspective, and you can capture it in about 45 seconds. Um, you can't really tell, but this I shot with ISO 800. I shot that entire night with ISO 800. I shot, I was shooting myself in the foot because there's so much noise and it's a terrible image and I was very disappointed. The stars don't really show up. Um, not happy with it. So really, you need to shoot with a lower ISO. Somebody was going to say something? Oh yeah. <laughs> I loved the image and then I looked at the stars and it wasn't what I wanted. Um, small aperture. Um, for a few reasons. This is one of my um, early images shooting the stars. Uh, I'm standing on a street. Uh, it's uh, probably 2 a.m. Um, I was shooting at f16. So, and it was a really, really still night. So I got nice, um, sharp tree, relatively, and I also got that nice, big circle. Um, another 30 minute exposure. By the way, your um, Nikon and Canon cameras, I don't know what the top of the line do, but nearly every single one that's under $2,000, they won't let you take an image longer than 30 minutes, period. So if you want to get a longer than 30 minute star trail, you're gonna have to shoot two or three images, you know, or combine several hundred. How do you do it beyond 30 minutes? How do you get beyond 30 seconds? Bam, right here. <laughs> if, you turn your, if you turn your shutter, as far as it'll go, it will likely end at 30 seconds, and then it'll hop one more to bulb setting. Um, bulb setting, if you are just using the shutter button, you have to hold down the shutter. So you have to have a remote because you can't hold your hand still for shoot three minutes, uh, let alone 30 minutes. Um, so get a remote. The IR remotes are very convenient because you can open the shutter with a click. You can walk inside 
read a book, walk outside, and close the shutter with a click. Because I would suggest shooting in the winter, and it's cold. Um, so use the bulb setting. Uh, obviously, if you're trying to make the stars stop, then you don't have to. But for any, any stellar motion, you're going to want to use your bulb setting. Um, and then, well, we already talked about the remote. Um, the North Star is just off the frame, and that's the Big Dipper, so you can see the, how much motion there is. Um, and my suggestion would be, if you want a lot of circular motion, use a wide lens. This is a 16 millimeter on my Nikon, which is a crop, so it's a 24 millimeter lens, essentially. Um, I don't like this image because, well, it's not going to show up. There's a big shadow right there, and it makes it ugly to me. Um, but that's a 16 millimeter. I've got lots of sky. I've got lots of star motion. And then um, this is what you get if you use a long lens. Uh, and I'm also facing, let's see, due west. So that's why the lines appear more straight. Um, and then my suggestions if you're going to go out and shoot star trails is um, shoot a five minute test stop, uh, a test shot, I'm sorry. Uh, it's going to give you an idea of whether or not your exposure is accurate. Because one of the most frustrating things is to get it at the end of 30 minutes and realize that it's completely too dark or completely too bright. Um, and this is imperative that you understand your camera because every camera's sensitivity is different. Uh, and uh, between my D50, 80, 90, and 7000, I have to adjust my settings a stop or two to get uh, you know, enough light in the sky and the surrounding area and not burn it out. Um, and then uh, learn when your camera's automatic shutoff timer ends. Fairly certain it's 30 minutes for all the cameras that we own, but it might not be. Uh, lastly, use manual focus. Um, if you aren't exactly certain where that great spot in the lens is, you're shooting f16 anyway. So point it at something that's a long way away and bright. Typically there's a street light somewhere around you. Um, focus on that. Move your camera and frame your shot. Uh, typically that will work for focusing. Um, I will, with the inexpensive 18 to 55 millimeter lenses that come with nearly every single camera out there, uh, it's really easy to just turn it all the way. And then a few things that can catch you, the rising moon, roaming clouds, cold weather and batteries is not a good combination. Uh, on my D7000, uh, my battery will last about five frames and that's it. So five 30 minute exposures and my battery's toast. Um, I always have a second battery, but fair warning. Um, and then random lights are bright over 30 minutes. If you have something in the horizon, or if you open your car door, it's a lot of light compared to the rest of the sky. And then lastly, pump your tripod. <laughs> um, and uh, that's, that's all I have. So, questions? So you're a night owl, I am not. Um, I don't want to be shooting at 2 in the morning. Well, what time can you start shooting? This is after sun, uh, sunset, and you after the blue hours over and everything? Five, five, eight. Yeah, yeah, that's right. that's the great thing about shooting in the winter. If you can, yeah, if you can tolerate the cold, you can start shooting great starscapes at six o'clock. Um, because the sun's completely set. You know, there's no there's no residual light, uh, ambient light. So and and you know, until sun up, if you like getting up at four in the morning. Um, same thing. You try to light painting or foregrounds. I have a few times. Um, one of my biggest frustrations with my star trails is that I have never found an adequate foreground object. One of my favorite images of star trails is uh, it's like a 14 millimeter one, so it's super wide, lake in the front. Dude's got a rowboat flipped upside down and it is red. And then he's got 
these huge star trail or star trails and they're reflected in the lake and it's just like I hate you you know it's such a great image um, the best uh, foreground object that I found is those trees but I haven't really gone out and like you know, uh, gravity. any suggestions areas around here to that are dark enough oh I have that's yeah. your part okay yep yeah. Um, not here. <laughs> you, uh, I have a few uh, images from of scenic Elgin where you'll see a few stars, but if you want to get the number of stars that you see in those images, you have to go a ways. Um, and he's got a map that will illustrate that, I assume. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm going to be jumping a couple of times between the presentation and then showing you how to do something in the software uh, so you can actually see it. Uh, you know, I can read all the books and I used to have a huge library of how to use Photoshop and this and that. And unless you actually, unless I actually sit down and do it, they're useless to me. That's not how I learn, by, by the, uh, reading something. I, I have to do it. That's why you have to forgive me of jumping back and down from my laptop to show you how to do it. And then, you know, you, you can always go online and find tutorials on this. Uh, okay, what do you need? I uh, need a camera. Any camera will work. Uh, preferably uh, cameras that have really good uh, noise canceling ability. Okay, so generally crop cameras have more noise at a given ISO than full frame cameras, right? There's a certain physics about the sensor um, that you squash more resolution into pixels, blah, 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 and you get more noise. And again, that's generally. There's always exceptions. Uh, there are specific models that excel at uh, low uh, uh, noise at any particular ISO for both Nikon and Canon. But generally speaking, a crop camera will have more noise at a given ISO. But any camera will work. Uh, Josh talked about a uh, shutter release uh, for my uh, Canon that I do most of my astrophotography with. I have a Canon. Uh, full remote control that, that gives you all these doohickeys and things and you can set it for intervals and all this crazy stuff. It's like several hundred dollars. Um, the Nikon, I have something that looks identical to it with the exact same stuff. It does not have a Nikon in it and costs 20 bucks. And you can buy both at Amazon or eBay or whatever you want. Um, and I use both. So you do, I, I'm not a big fan of the remote control ones. I usually just take my uh, not the infrared ones, I should say, uh, the wireless ones. I usually just take my wired remote, strap it on the camera so it doesn't fall off, and just leave it there. Um, usually, if you're doing bulk mode, it works pretty well too. <laughs> Tripod. Um, when I first started doing this many, many decades ago with my friend, um, we went to Calumet Photo. I remember this, and Calumet Photo had a sale on tripods, and I want to say their branded steel tripod was like 80, 90 bucks. I'm like, oh, cool, cheap tripod. My friend is, you don't want to buy it. He goes, ah, oh, come on, get out of here. No, you want to buy this one front of it is three, four hundred dollars. Like, no, I'm not, I have money for that. I'm going to buy this $80 Calumet brand. So the first time we went to the UP to, to uh, take photos of, uh, 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 of waterfalls or something it was, and it was like a half hour hike to it, I cursed so much that I did not buy that three, four hundred dollar carbon fiber tripod versus the seven pounds steel tripod that feels like 700 pounds after you're carrying it for 20 minutes. Okay, so invest in the good tripod. Uh, I know there's cheapos out there, but again, if you're, going to, if you're just going to come on Saturday, you know, you're, you're going to go from the car to the parking lot, you're good. If you're adventurous like some of us and you hike and walk for a long time with it, um, you don't want to carry it. It became my rocketry mounted launcher thing. <laughs> because I'm not carrying it anymore. Uh, clear dark skies, I'll get to that in a minute. Like I said, I remember when I started doing this 20, 25 years ago, Randall Road was a single lane dirt road, okay? That's not the case anymore. Uh, Photoshop, or not, I will show you both. Um, and then time, we need lots of it. Um, 30 minute exposures, I really am horrible at 30 minute exposures. The reason is, I'm a plus. So at 27 minutes, I will bump my tripod. It's a given fact. It will happen no matter how much you try to avoid it. 
or a big truck will come at me and shine his lights to see what the heck am I doing in a farmland corner in the middle of nowhere and leave the lights on at about 27 and a half minutes. So it always happens. That's why I keep nice short um, uh, shots and you know with one of those remotes you can you know you just set the remote and just walk away. And, and if one or two shots out of 90 are bad, I don't really care. Right? I can exclude them <coughs> All right, light pollution chart. You can, there's several universities that have a dynamic, a live uh, light pollution map. Uh, this is one of the better ones. It doesn't change really, unless you save them over decades, then you can see the real change that occurs. Uh, we are, here's the cow, there's algebra. So we're here. As you can see, it goes from what are you thinking to really, really nice, uh, really quickly. So, um, I remember Hampshire, which was somewhere around here, I believe, uh, used to be green 20 years ago, and that's not the case anymore. Uh, if you want to do really good astrophotography, uh, star trails or uh, galaxies or nebulas, you really have to be in the lighter orange into the yellows. Uh, anything else you're picking up in long exposures, you're picking up a lot of noise, a lot of uh, uh, light pollution and yellows, I think yellows and reds are the most prominent colors I've seen in long exposures. Um, and it's really tough to remove those unless you have some good software ability. Uh, so anything in the yellow uh, parts here, you can probably go into the orange, but yellow or, or better is where you want to go. Okay? The more you are towards Elgin, the less stars you see. Makes sense, right? And if you're shooting, you know, if your goal is to shoot star trails, if you see less charts, you're going to get less trails. You know, uh, Josh went to what? Missouri to get some clear skies. Um, but, you know, closer to the Mississippi is better, away from the big towns. And unfortunately, you do have to do a little planning. Um, because, one, you have to be careful of the moon, you know, where the moon is going to rise. The other one, if you are looking for something like a tree or some object, you have to be careful if you're here, you're not pointing directly northwest into Rockford, because that dome of Rockford is going to show up on your exposures, right? So you have to do a little planning you know, on where you're going to go um, and where you're going to point your camera. And a lot of these red spots don't show up on your pictures <coughs> until you take a long exposure. And you're going to say, oh, this is really horrible, okay? Um, so you, it does require a little planning. Again, this map, it's a Google map, so you can move it all around, all over the U.S. You can, and it shows you exactly why, where all the light pollution is all over the U.S. You can all load the moon, like mission. So um, this is real good. You can download it. You can take pictures of the, the map and, and have it with you to plan your little night out. Okay. Any questions about the light pollution map? It is very sad. Like I said, I used to have my telescope up at Hampshire. You could see so many stars 15 years ago out of Hampshire. Um, and this is not the case today. Can you give me a city in yellow? I'm sorry? Can you read one of the cities in yellow? Oh, jeez, let's see. Is that Wisconsin? Or no, no, that's Rockford. So this big red spot here is, oopsie, is Rockford. So that's Rockford. So this is 39. Okay. So this is Highway 39 coming right straight down to Rockford. So this, it's not really too far. Well, Wisconsin's way up, you know, it's up here. So really, you know, around. Um, uh, uh, I don't know what's it. Rochelle-ish is really good. It's far enough as long as you're not shooting north, right? Josh, uh, I was going to say that the Cadillac in the barn. I had two or three photos of that. Mm -hmm. uh, directly south of Rockford, there's that smaller orange shot, and go out just beyond that yellow. That's where that barn is. Yep. And it's it's a great location. Um, not a lot of traffic on the road. It's a county highway, and uh, yeah. So here's DeKalb and Sycamore. So just going just a little bit west of DeKalb and Sycamore to get out of the lights of DeKalb is is still close. You know, reasonably close enough, and still have reasonably good lights in yellows. Um, another thing is the weather, right? Uh, if if the uh, the jet stream is right over us, you're going to have a lot of flickering, you know, twinkling stars. That's because the jet stream is over us and it's not going to give you nice, sharp lines. Okay, your lines are going to be a little shabby. 
jagged. So you have to kind of look at the weather map to see where the jet stream is, because that affects the twinkling of the stars. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, now in the winter, where it's nice and cold, you have better trans transparency in the sky. And I'll show you that in the next slide. But of course, it's a lot cooler. So. Do you guys say ask people before you like go and stand on that land or whatever? I'm sorry, saying. Do you ask any of these people if it's okay? To oh, certainly. Um, you know, I don't go on private property, especially if you're going to walk west with a lot of people with shotguns. Yeah. I would not go on their farmland and put my tripod on and start taking hours of photos. Uh, my, my buddy has his house in Hampshire. That's kind of worked out really well. Uh, there are uh, there are astronomy clubs all over the area that have every weekend uh, dark sky nights reserved in forest reserves that uh, are allowed to be there overnight. And you can go in there with your camera. There's a lot. It used to be half. It's not half anymore. But uh, there are a lot of astrophotographers that take nebula pictures or just regular pictures. So there are opportunities uh, to do a lot of that stuff. If you know someone, you know. Um, but uh, generally, uh, I know this like Kirkland, is the, the, some of the New York reserves, if you're there with a tripod, usually the forest police will come ask you a few questions and they'll kind of let you go. Or just call the county police and say, you know, I'm going to take some pictures and I feel dark, you know, I'm just letting you know that I'm going to be here a little late, you know. I know you close, I'll try to be out of here as soon as possible, you know, give them the information so they don't show up with guns blazing, you know. The, so, go ahead. There's a site south of Dixon called Green River State Wildlife Area. It's pretty much open all the time. A lot of deep sky photographers go out there and set up. It might be closed for a week or two around honey season, otherwise it's open year round. So, what was the name of that again? Uh, Green River uh, uh, State Wildlife Area. So that's about it's Green River State. Well, it's an Illinois DNR site south of Dixon. South of Dixon. Yes. I know there's times I've been up in Door County, but it's, uh, there's almost all these constant shooting stars. Mm -hmm. It seems like the Milky Way, you just reach out and touch it. And it, it's just, it's almost heavy with, with stars when you really get up there. Uh, do shooting stars impact your shots at all? Because somebody told me there, there are constant shooting stars you just don't see. One of the photos I can have a shooting star, I'll, I'll show you how you move it. A lot of people in their star trails, they don't like airplane and shooting stars and that darn ISS going through it. I'll show you how to remove it, it's really easy. But yeah, if you're uh, in Door County and you're shooting east, that's beautiful. If you're shooting west, you're going to get the light dome of Green Bay. But if you're shooting this, uh, east, it is, it is incredible. It is incredibly dark. OK, moving on. It's been a lot of time. Uh, there is a clear uh, darksky.com website out there. It basically gives you a graph. It's updated hourly, I believe, on the site. And there's lots of fixed sites. Uh, for every state, I think Illinois has maybe like 50 of them. Uh, and you can create your own if you want. And it'll basically tell you the almost live uh, uh, transparency and uh, darkness for your site. And it's really easy to read. Obviously, uh, sunrise, this, here's the sunset, and this is when it's dark. Um, and then it basically is the scene, how well uh, you can see in the sky, how transparent it is, if there's any cloud cover. Obviously, the darker the cloud, the better. So you can kind of plan your, your outing. You know, and it's, you know, I used to, when I used to do a lot of astrophotography, I used this religiously, and it failed me less than 5% of the time. Where I drove for two hours, and it's like, really? And then drove back. That happened very infrequently. So this chart is usually really good. And this one's for here, hot in the States, I believe. Uh, but there are sites all over the US already filled out. So if you go to Illinois, you can see all these charts and pick the one closest you want to go to. Um, exposures, we talked about exposures. I like 30 seconds. It's nice. It's small enough, uh, but still has a lot of uh, 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 image uh, in, in your uh, stars. Uh, I can go up to a minute. A minute is pretty good. I avoid going over a minute. If it's hot, you're going to get a lot of noise because your sensor is very hot. So if it's hot outside, your sensor is going to get, go, get a lot hotter, a lot quicker than 30 minutes. And if you have one of our newer cameras, it's going to shut down on you after a minute or two because that sensor gets too hot. The camera knows that it's going to shut your exposure, whether you like it or not, to protect that sensor. Okay. If it's cold outside, then you could go a lot more. I mean, I've run um, uh, on a star tracking tripod up to 60 minutes in the cold. 
So those are some of the settings we use. Um, your ISO kind of depends on the camera and your tolerance for noise, right? The more you bump it up, if you have a very inexpensive cropped camera, you're gonna get a lot more noise in the miniature and you can say, ah. Versus you have a, a newer camera that ISO 1600, you see almost no noise, right? All kind of depends on the camera. Um, and these are some suggested um, exposures that are on. I'm going quite fast because we only have like 10 minutes. Okay, Photoshop. How do you do this in Photoshop? It's really simple. It looks complex, but in reality, it's really simple. You have all your shots. Um, you come out of the camera, you can do it as raw. Problem with raw is they're really, really big, and when you're talking about 60 of them, unless you have a power machine with tons of RAM and an SDD drive, you're going to be sitting there for a long time where your machine is churning, try to process all this stuff. All my stuff, all my star trails and uh, uh, low exposure stuff, I do in JPEGs. You know, I've got a D700, the JPEG out of a D700 is really, really good quality, right? Um, so what you gotta do is you use Adobe Bridge, which comes with Photoshop, uh, load up all your images, and it has a cool feature that says basically tools, Photoshop, and load into layers. <coughs> That's what you want to do. You want to load all your images as separate layers in Photoshop. And I'll show you in a second why. So now you've got all your images and layers. Again, if you're going to have 90 layers in Photoshop, open at once, you're going to have a really super duper machine. Right? Another thing you can do is cheat. Do like 20 or 30 at a time. And then stack the 5, 30 of them. Okay, that's going to be a lot faster than trying to do 90 at once. Okay? So, Adobe Bridge, bring them all into Photoshop. First, you make all uh, visible. And it's really easy to make all your layers visible. Just go to layers, layer, and then hide, make, I say visible, invisible. Because you, you don't want them all at once. You want to uh, edit each one individually. Make them all, uh, except for the last one, invisible. But before I do this, it's just that I, I clicked one by one, layer by layer. Now you can just do them all at once. Uh, so for then each layer, you want to set the blending options to light. That's the key. So every layer, and when I do, uh, when I shoot the Andromeda Galaxy, I use combine because I want to combine all my images, amplify the uh, signal, and get rid of the noise. It's got to be like 20, 30 different blending options. The key is light. Okay, um, I'll show you lighting at 100%. There's a slider how bright you want those star trails to be. That's all you're doing. How bright you want those star trails to be. Um, and then finally, uh, make visible each layer. As you make visible, visible each layer, I think my examples here have 30 second shots. You'll see the, the circles getting drawn individually. You said JPEG, right? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna make sure it's a Alright. Um, I'm gonna try to do this. Yeah, no, no. Okay. So let's do this real quickly. I have. Oh, no, it's wrong. Oh. Yep. So here's all the images, all 30 second images, all JPEGs. All have been uh, taken down to 1600 by 900 or right cropped, uh, made small. So let's bring up. Um, excuse me, sir. Yep. Could you move the microphone to the left, just or our left, just a bit because it's covering up. The sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. There's. All right. All right. Okay. Here we go. All my images. Let's see how many there are. All right, so those are all the images. Uh, let's do it again. Tell it the way. There. So I have 90. I'm not going to do 90. I'm going to be sitting here all day. But here's what my images. I'm going to pick, let's say, this many. And, oops, where's my bridge? Bridge. There. Uh, let's go to desktop. Let's go to Star Trails. Let's pick, normally you would pick all of them. I'm just going to pick 20. Here's the cool thing, cool tools, Photoshop, load files into Photoshop layers. Okay, that's the key you want. Mm -hmm. Click on that. 
It brings up Photoshop. And in Photoshop, it will bring up each picture. It will open every picture and make it into its own layer. There they are. Um, I would select all layers by going from the first one down to the last one. And then go to layer. Uh, where is high? There it is. Okay. All my layers are loaded. I'm not looking at anyone. Start with one. I usually start in the bottom, but you can start with the top. And what you want to do is click on your layer. Oops. Blend options. And here's where you can mess around with a lot of what you want each one to do. Um, for this example, like we want to lighten those bright stars. Here's your um, sliders. I'm just going to leave them alone. I'm going to go to the next one. Do this for each one of them. Right click on each of your layers. Switch them to the light. Okay. Keep going. I'm just going to do a few since we're running out of time. <coughs> And now what you do is, as you're turning them on, notice what's happening. Hmm. Try to make this picture bigger. Okay, so as I'm turning all my layers on, uh, you're not seeing a lot of it because the blending options are not set to the light. Now you can start seeing the circle. How light you want those circles, how bright you want them, you can start seeing them really a lot now. Um, all depends on that slider. Set to 100%, ultimately they're going to be very, very bright, big, white, and you can start seeing the circles coming along. Okay? It's really that simple. Taking 90 will take a long time, um, but uh, it's, it's, the process is all the same. Load them up as separate, as separate layers, each layer hide them. Um, just so you can see each one at a time. I know one of these layers in here has a um, star trail going through them. Can't remember which one it was anymore. Uh, but uh, okay, any questions on how to do it in Photoshop? Very simple to do, right? Bring them all. Use Bridge. Open them up as layers. Hide all your layers. Uh, go to the uh, blending options for each layer individually and switch it to lighten and then turn them all on, and it'll draw a circle for you, okay? All right, now you're going to tell me, wait, James. I don't have money for Photoshop. What am I going to do? Okay, there's lots of software out there. I picked this one because it exists on the PC and the Mac, and it costs zero. It's free, okay? It's a beautiful piece of software. Let me show you how to use that. This does exactly what I just showed you in one step. Star Stacks. Okay, so let's open Star Stacks. Star Stacks. Very small application. Very easy to do. Just follow the instructions. Drop your images there. Yes, sir. Here, pick all your images, drop them here. All right, well, okay, nothing's happened, right? So, what you want to do is go to View, oops, I think it's Edit, yep, Edit Preferences. I think, I just can't see. Mm -hmm. That's 90 seconds. You, you'd see the exact same thing. Notice how it happened slowly. It's the exact, it literally runs the exact same action that Photoshop does. It turns on one of those photos at a time. You see a lot of noise. I tried to play. Someone had mentioned how do you, you know, paint your foreground. I tried one or two images. I tried doing that with a flash bulb, you know, flashlight and so just to bring up some of that. But then you can save this as a JPEG and you're done. Okay, so you can do it either way. You can do it into 
uh, in Photoshop, or you can use star stacks. Um, it, they both do the same exact action. You're bringing up all those images as layers, you're making them into lighting, which is the default, and it has all the other options that Photoshop does, and then it turns them all one at a time. That's how it drew that spark. Um, you can go back and start editing. You can turn it on and off, just like in Photoshop. Any one of these, the one that has the airplane in them, or the one that has the comet or whatever, you can turn it off. Um, so it's not part of your image. Turning one or two off won't have a big break. Um, turning a lot of them off will see breaks in your circles. Okay? And this was what, 90? Uh, so this was 45 minutes, but shot 90, uh, 30 seconds at a time. Okay, and you basically sit back and just let it do its thing. Just avoid having, well, I was gonna say someone, me, keep the track. Okay, um, any questions? That's really, you know, I, I see people struggling in how to do it. There's lots of videos out there that has all these really complex methods of doing this. Um, I like things simple, because I can, if I only do this like once a year, I can never remember the next year what I did, right? So that's why I like it simple, I write it down, the next year when I want to blend my stars, there they are. They're really, really simple to put in there. All right, any questions? That is my presentation. Oh, these are not my images, by the way. These are not my pictures. I borrow these. Oh, this looks like a 30 millimeter. It's pretty wide. And right now it's cut off. <laughs> the other side, but this looks like a pretty wide image. Okay, any other questions? So you can do it in Photoshop. I like to do things manually because when things go wrong, you know, after I do this and it doesn't draw my circle, then I'm stuck, right? Um, I don't know what to do. So I want to learn it so that I can see, well, if something went wrong, I cannot fix it, you know, diagnose it. So I showed you the manual way. Now, I know people that have, what I just did, you can put make, record into an action, click on your action in Photoshop and do this for you, right? But I've noticed like it doesn't like really, really obscene long file paths. So if your, you know, if your uh, folder name is like seven segments long, and then your file name itself is like 100 characters, uh, Photoshop is not gonna like that in an action and it's gonna just stop working. Um, but then you don't know unless you know how to you know, diagnose actions, right? Then you kind of stop. That's why I like knowing, doing it manually just to see what the product is doing and then record an action for it. It's easy to record that action because you're gonna do the same darn thing you know, 90 times, right? Hide, hide it, lighten it, do that 90 times, right? right? How many images you have and then turn one at a time. And it's nice to turn one at a time because uh, then you'll see if you have, you know, which image turning on caused that star trail or that, you know, a fallen star or the ISS or the plane. Then you can just unclick that one and go. Okay, any questions? And there's nothing magic about the 90. It's, if it's 80, it's going to get you in the ballpark. No, so nothing magical. 80, it's going to be no. He stopped at 90 only because we were drinking too many beers. Simple as that. So the more you do, obviously, the longer those circles are going to happen. Right. And the more beer you can drink. And the, yeah, and the nice thing about those, you know, uh, fancy remote uh, controls is that, you know, in the bulb mode, it tells you, you know, you can set, um, you know, I want 90, 30 seconds. You set it on there and just let it go. It does it all for you. So on um, four, literally walk away, go inside. Absolutely. Absolutely. The thing you do have to care about is the batteries, right? Those batteries are not going to last uh, 45 minutes. There's no way I can get one battery to last 45 minutes. Right? So uh, you will have to change a battery quickly. Um, on my Canon, I have uh, uh, the powered battery thingy that goes into the, I mean, it looks like a battery it goes into your battery compartment, but it hooks up into power. So I have that for my astrophotography because I don't want to deal with batteries. Um, but other than that, yeah, um, and that runs off of uh, portable batteries pretty well too. It doesn't suck a lot of power, but it does power it does enough to power your camera. There's, so the problem with changing your battery in the middle of something like this is you will bump your camera. Right. You okay. will end up with a hiccup. Just period. Yeah. So 
and you have to do it quickly to avoid the break in your Star Trek. So, so you have to do it blindly, right? Because you're not gonna move the camera to get under to, to figure out. So you have to know which click to do to get that battery dropped and put the next battery in quickly. Okay, like loading the clip in a magazine. Do it by nature. Yes. Before I know all the celebrity photography, he gets these little cameras, he takes them, not takes them, those rubber bands around the front lens and keep you off the lens. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's lots of tricks, and you will learn all the things that can go back when you start doing this. You know, if you're pointing up, um, if you don't have your lens cover on your lens, the dew is going to start forming on your lens. So the, the lens cover avoids some of that depending on the angle that you're facing, but it's not 100%. So for my telescopes, you know, we have dew heaters. So there, it's basically, you know, a little heat strap that goes around the the, the lens part of your telescope or your camera, and you can't feel the heat, but there's just enough heat to avoid the dew occurring on your lens. Because that's the worst thing, right? You've set this up for 90 minutes exposure, and you come back in the house because it's way too cold, and you come back and you got nothing because your lens is dewed up. And we got a lot of dew here, so. That's, a, that's another advantage of shooting in the winter, is there's less moisture in the air. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that is if you breathe in the general direction of your where your lens is pointing, you'll end up with a cloud. Even on a even on a 30 minute exposure, that one breath just adds just that little bit of fog. It's aggravating. I speak from experience. And don't bring food with you if you're going to go to a secluded place. Um, if, so, not that I've ever done this, <laughs> um, but you know, I may have like an open candy bar or something in my camera bag, and I'll go back in the car and wait till it's warm and play on my iPad for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and come back. And the raccoons have moved the tripod to point the so long. So you know, avoid having food close to the camera. Um, so that's yeah, all this kind of stuff. You do this for years. All this little stuff you learn the hard way. So, any other questions? Um, sometime next year, um, I will do an astrophotography class. You know how to how to take a picture of a galaxy uh, with a three-hour exposure. You're obviously, not going to shoot for three hours. And I bring a telescope, um, and we can play with that and show you how to do that with a telescope. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you all very much. Um, next.